Welcome to Office Hours Podcast. We're joined by Jamel Hill. Jamel, thanks for joining us. It's been a probably crazy last 18 months for you. What what has that transition been from ESPN now to stuff with Spotify, The Atlantic, and, and just really the next stage of your career personally? It's been really great. Um, it, it has been a, a lot of work. It's definitely... Um, you know, for as busy as I thought my life was at ESPN, this is on steroids for sure. Because, you know, when you it, it, when you do everything at one place, then, you know, there, that's just a different way to manage it. But when you're working for multiple people or doing multiple things on multiple platforms, uh, it can um, it can get quite hectic. So it's it's been very, um, you know, it's been a learning experience trying to balance it all. But it's been exhilarating because I really feel like at this point in my career, I kind of have a blank canvas and am able to stick my hand in a lot of different things. And so, um, you know, I'm, I'm excited about that opportunity, but there are some days where I definitely look at my calendar and say, was I drunk when I filled this out? Like what happened? Why do I have all this on here? Why is it from 8 AM to 8 PM? Yeah. When, especially, I mean, you know, furthering that adjustment, I'm getting used to living on the West coast and I know, I we used to be one of those East Coast people that when West Coast uh, folks complained, especially when it came to sports about, you know, game times and that sort of thing. And, you know, just the world um, or I should say America just being completely, um, you know, our whole country runs on an East Coast time zone for the most part. You know, I, I used to think those complaints were a little silly. Now that I live here, I get it. And so that four o'clock game. Oh, huh? my gosh. And not just the games. It's just. I write, I can write later. You know, I made it file a column. Like I just filed a column um, as of the taping of this podcast. I filed a column about LeBron James. I filed it last night. And for my editor, it was like 1 a.m. You know, for me, obviously it was, you know, clearly not the same. It was 10, 10 p.m. or so. He got to it this morning. And when he got to it this morning, it was 6 a.m. my time. I was not up at 6 a.m. So, we, I mean, we, we have a really good uh, relationship, but it's just by the time I wake up, because so much of what I do is still on the East Coast, you're automatically two or three hours behind. And so that has taken, that's probably been the biggest adjustment out of all of this. And what can happen is that you may start your day out here in LA at like six or 7 a.m., but in LA time, it's still a business day. So by the time the East Coast is done, we still got three hours to go. And it's just it. some days, uh, depending on how my schedule works out, the days can feel quite long. Like I've done two business days in one. Yeah, 11 hour business days. Yeah, right? pretty much. And so, um, but look, I, I guess the trade off is on Sundays, you know, Sunday night football is pretty much over at like 7, 8 p.m. <laughs> so, so you're ready for bed. <laughs> so you're just, or you could still go out and have dinner. You know, there's so much of my sports day when I lived on the East Coast was consumed by the NFL. And it still is. But now I don't feel nearly as guilty about it because uh, everything's kind of wrapped up by about 8, 830. And, and for you, you know, you came out of a place where you probably had other offers to go to another organization and now kind of you know, running your own thing and your own person. Why at this point in your career, did you feel like it was the right time to do something like this? Well, uh, the way I, I when I had these conversations with myself as I was kind of plotting what my next steps were, was that this is this is all the equity that I put into a 20 year journalism career, all coming into a point uh, where I could cash in. And so um, I think uh, for me, having spent so long under and working under and within a particular media media model, which is you work for ESPN, you work for a newspaper, which I did for many years before I got to ESPN. You work for one sole entity and you do everything within that entity. And I wanted the opportunity to explore a little bit more, to play a little bit more. Um, And frankly, I, in all honesty, I wanted the freedom to um, be able to decide for myself what I wanted to be involved with and what I didn't. And anybody knows when you work for any corporation, and especially if you're in media, there's not that level of autonomy. Um, So much of what you want to do sometimes or oftentimes conflicts with what the company agenda is. Or, um, you know, if a company has a certain image or if um, they're worried about how people might perceive you being in certain spaces, they take all the criticism and the blowback. And so you wind up being 
uh, in a marriage that, uh, you know, you feel like you have to do a lot of compromising. And so I just wanted the feeling of not having everything I wanted to do wind up being, uh, you know, an email chain. And so, and it feels great because the email chain is me yeah. <laughs> and that's it. Do I want to do this or not? And that's a, a really good feeling. And I, you know, I, I wanted um, kind of just this, to use this time and this, this opportunity to kind of not just cash in on the equity I've built in my journalism career, but put myself in some different spaces besides sports. And the great thing is, um, you know, I guess if you want to say there was a, a silver lining to all the controversy, I guess, that I caused at ESPN is that it got people to see me in a different way. And being able to weigh in on political and social I issues in a in a in a harder way, in a deeper way, in a more meaningful way, has been really exhilarating for me because I before I got to the Atlantic, uh, I spent my last few months at ESPN writing for the Undefeated, but it had been a while since I've been a full time writer. So getting back to that has been um, a real jolt for me at this point in my career. And when it comes to talking about politics and sports on a deeper level, and and there's obviously been this conversation in in the media just in general about what like a role sports plays in politics. Is it something that you think can be deeper from both a mainstream standpoint, or is it something like, you know, that sports, that sports, this is politics, this is politics. We only engage on certain areas. Well, this is not like the lunch tray you got at school where the peas were in one <laughs> section, the pizza in another and uh, the chocolate milk, the chocolate milk. Yeah, yeah. No, this is not like that. I mean, sports, politics, social issues, they've always been mashed together because there have been moments where sports has been able to kind of lead the rest of the rest of society with, um, you know, uh, with a uh, with advancement. You know, I mean, Jackie Robinson integrated Major League Baseball in 1947. That was almost 20 years before the the. Uh, Civil Rights Act was passed. And so um, sports can kind of push society to a place that it hasn't gotten to yet. And, you know, the one thing that's kind of beautiful about sports is that it's one of the few things that people in this country do together. Um, we tend to worship uh, separately. Uh, most of us eat or socialize with people who are just like us or very like minded. Sports forces you into spaces uh, and into a situation where you're kind of jammed up against people who don't have maybe your same beliefs, aren't from your same area. I mean, they're Cowboys fans in L.A. and they're Cowboys fans in Dallas. And Stephen A. Smith is still happy regardless. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so you um, so you, you know, fandom kind of brings people together. And I think it would be remiss if that opportunity wasn't taken to talk about some issues that do frankly impact sports. I mean, it's not like you can think of any issue right now that people are grappling with in this country. And I guarantee you there's a sports angle that's in there. Uh, people, um, and to some degree, I get it. Like in this time, especially it's very turbulent. It's very volatile. People are divided that they want to break. And so a lot of times they look at sports to provide that break, that sense of entertainment, um, and I understand that because they can get really mentally fatigued. However, that being said, it's like they have to I think they're being a little bit dishonest um, because uh, we talk about plenty of issues under the umbrella of sports that nobody has a problem with that are not sports related. Uh, you know, obviously not saying that this shouldn't be the case. And I think it's it's been extraordinary. But nobody's on ESPN's case about the Jimmy V Foundation. You know, I, I get that. Jim Valvano was a sports figure, but it's not ESPN's job to help cure cancer. But yet, nevertheless, they felt like from a social standpoint that that was the responsible thing to do is that here they had somebody who was a beloved sports figure, somebody who worked with them, that they wanted to champion a cause that was personal to them. Nobody complains about that. But because we can all agree that cancer is bad, right? Yeah. But when it comes to issues that for some people, strangely, are more uh, debatable, like police brutality, you know, everybody wants to um, kind of clutch their imaginary pearls and and talk about how they don't want to talk about police brutality. Uh, well, you got to talk about it if you want to understand why Colin Kaepernick is taking a knee or why other players, why this issue means something to them. So um, I like to think that people are a little more, um, you know, intellectually honest in understanding how sports and politics and social issues are intertwined together. 
uh, especially as sports, American sports become more global. Um, it's just a reality. And I'm sorry that you can't sit there, uh, you know, some days and watch ESPN without being reminded that sports does not operate in a separate world. It's still operating in the world you live in. And the players that you may love and the coaches you may love, they're operating as citizens in that world. And I'm sorry that you from time to time have to be reminded of that. But that's what it is. And that relationship's always been there. It's not going anywhere. And uh, especially when we're in a time where players are feeling more empowered uh, to be vocal about things they care about. It's just something that you have to accept. And one of the most pressing cases of the empowerment to be more vocal is what just happened with what's going on in China and the NBA. You wrote a column for the Ath- or the Atlantic said the NBA is going to have to choose. Do you think the NBA chose right? Well, here's the thing. And then that this is why it was, um, you know, why I noted the fact that every issue uh, somehow relates back to sports. If you've been watching the presidential debates, they have there have been several questions and just in general if you've just been paying attention to current events obviously there's a trade war going on with china one of the things many of the candidates have talked about is the fact that um the issues with china as it relates to intellectual property the fact that you know china is a world power have a billion people and that that opens an opportunity some business opportunities that are enormous. There's a ton of American companies that do business with China, despite the fact you're talking about doing business with a repressive government who you do not share the same ideals about um, access to technology, access to, or or, um, the expression of free speech or any of that That is not a shared thing, but yet there's a hunger there for American culture. And so um, to me, it's kind of amazing that the NBA got this far in their relationship with China and this hasn't happened. Yeah. And I know that, um, you know, just in personal relationships and me and me and some of my girlfriends have had this talk before. It's really hard to carry on a relationship when you and the person, the things that really count, you don't share. You don't have the same core values. You can you can disagree on tater tots, whether or not they're good. <laughs> You can't, you know, you can't disagree on certain other things that are kind of intrinsic to who you are as a person. And I get that there's this idea that by bringing basketball into China and um, building a basketball empire there, that that's showing that people of different, you know, political viewpoints, they can work together uh, or appreciate something together. And that is true to an extent. But if the cost is China has a hissy fit because of a tweet that, let's be honest, and I say this in my column, this wasn't exactly Martin Luther King Jr.'s letters from a Birmingham jail. Okay, this was a tweet of an image and China overreacted to such a degree that I just think that the NBA may wind up in more situations like that with them. Um, And and I realize this situation in itself has proven probably to be a pretty big lesson to somebody maybe somewhere who thought about saying something about China. And and I get that part of it. But sometimes there are certain bridges you cannot gap if the values are that far apart. And especially as these protests continue, you know, we don't know. um, And there's there's a whole ton of human rights issues in China and you just don't know how um, what person uh, that that may affect and you know what are what would they do if there's I mean they've obviously they've had a Chinese player in Yao Ming but as the game continues to grow more global and they you see this situation um, with Ennis Cantor I mean he's not even allowed in his own country and as the the game continues to grow more internationally and the NBA becomes a haven for more international players, these situations are going to be at the forefront. And I just, I do wonder if um, at some point the NBA, I'm not saying that they should pull out of China because that's unrealistic yeah. um, at this point. Like the relationship's way too deep. It's too much money. It's probably unrealistic, but how much at some point are they going to keep having to kind of compromise and wager their own credibility to make this work. And there's always a breaking point in those relationships. And so I'm just wondering what will the NBA's breaking point be, especially as they look to expand 
even more into the Chinese market. Do you think if it was a, another league besides the NBA, the NHL, NFL, MLB, this would have been treated differently because of what is going on with the NBA and, and the outspokenness of the players with issues domestically? Oh, no question. I mean, look, there's a... It was it was no shock that a lot of conservatives, a lot of people on the right, took this as an opportunity to just fire away at the NBA, even though it just seemed like what if we're less than two years removed from uh, Laura Ingram telling LeBron to shut up and dribble, right? Suddenly now they all want him, you know, to basically be rock, Rocky facing down Drago, right? <laughs> yeah, Suddenly yeah. defeat communism, LeBron, all on your own. And yeah, that's that's really hypocritical because when it comes to uh, the players talking about social issues in America they care about, they're told to be silent. And so they want them to take on this international fight. Then Starbucks has it's a lot of Starbucks in China. Nobody's asking Starbucks to take on China. Right. And so I found that part of it to be extremely unfair and it's exposed um, a lot of people's, um, you know, hypocrisy. And uh, look, the, the the problem for the NBA, at least domestically, is that the reason fans or one of the reasons fans love the NBA is because the players and their self-expression. And this is a league that has allowed players to um, boast their personalities, to speak very honestly and authentically about the things that they care about. In some cases, as in LeBron's case, Steph Curry, Kevin Durant, to speak out against their own government. And so they've created a brand where that kind of outspokenness is part of it. And so uh, I think a lot of people are just really curious uh, looking at the brand that they build and saying like, okay, so wait a minute. Uh, you're outspoken about uh, outspoken about this, but with this issue that seems to be pretty serious, that suddenly um, the comments are a lot more measured. And I, to, I do understand that in the sense of, uh, you know, it's it's much easier for these players to speak about issues in America because they live here and they've experienced them. They don't know anything about the history of China, of Beijing, Hong Kong relations, and that's probably asking a lot of them. Uh, but the one thing that they can't stand for just on principle is having another country try to influence your freedom of expression. Yeah. yeah communism is your thing, China, not ours. <laughs> and so it's like, you know, it, as much as I know the players resent the fact that Daryl Morey and, they, and they've been put in this position by the Chinese government, at the end of the day, they have to side with with uh, Daryl Morey because um, you can't have a league that is uh, run by another country, you know, and like they have to live here. And it's just it's just certain boundaries that you have to draw, because what if there's a, a player at some point that wants to say something or if Daryl Morey was a player and uh, and tweeted that they'd stick up for another player. And so you don't want to ever treat freedom of speech like it's a case by case basis. It's all or nothing. And I know sometimes the all seems like a lot. But it has to be, it can't be treated halfway. Do you think there would have been a right, I mean, is there a really right way to handle something of this magnitude? Well, the right way is unfortunately the most uncomfortable way. And the uncomfortable way to handle this is China just gonna have to be mad. That's just really what it boils down to. <laughs> and, you know, and, and here's the thing though, I think the NBA has much more leverage than they're behaving, as, they're behaving like they don't have any. Yeah. And the, the truth is there's 300 million people playing basketball in China. They want LeBron James. When Space Jam 2 comes out, they want to see it, right? Yeah. And so while they may not have the overall upper hand because China has a, a, a great deal of money, a great deal of American interest, and as I heard a comedian once joke, if China cashed a check, we all in trouble. So, <laughs> um, And I get that part of it, but culture is – probably one of the things that um, one of the few things that America we still make that the rest of the world is thirsty to buy and consume. And so they just need to use whatever leverage they have to kind of let China know that, yeah, I hear you. You don't like it when people criticize your government, but you might have to live with this just like we have to live with your repression and just let it be what it is. And everybody can still make money together um, as long as they're not telling each other what to do and how to run things. And so for 
um, you know, their government to pull the the broadcasting of the preseason games and pull all the sponsorship. That was just a, a huge overreaction. You can be business partners. You don't have to be best friends. Totally. And it's just like the partnership up until this moment, far as we know, was working was working fine. But, um, you know, I, I think for China to flex. Um, and then you asked if it was another league, would this have been a, a thing? Honestly, I wonder if it was another team, it would not It would be a, yeah. a, another NBA team. I mean, Houston, we're talking about one of the most popular teams in China, and I think that probably had a lot to do with it. If, you know, the Raptors GM does this, I don't know if it resonates the same, or maybe not the Raptors. And then but, you have you the know, Lakers and the Nets going there, yeah, two very popular I mean, teams, LeBron. Because LeBron, you know, I, I tell you what, though, I mean, on the other end of it, if LeBron had tweeted this, I doubt if China's trying to ban LeBron. He's just way too important there, you know, yeah. or Kobe Bryant, who is one of the most popular players in China. Any of their most popular sought after players. I don't know if this still resonates the same. It'd be uncomfortable. But, you know, I mean, if somebody, you know, if the Pistons GM tweets that, like, they don't care. Yeah. And I mean, look, outside of the statement that was tweeted in response to what he tweeted we haven't heard much from daryl morey obviously well not and surprising. of course not surprising, yeah not right? sure but the as, nba has put him <laughs> on military silence but as <laughs> someone who you know obviously went through some controversy but not to that level of controversy what is like being on that side of the table and probably dealing with all of this internally well from that standpoint i could definitely relate to what daryl morey is because i'm sure there are thoughts that he'd like to offer and he'd like to share his experience or just put his story in his own words and when you're employed by a corporation and a team or, you know, he's employed by the team, but he's a part of a larger machine in the NBA. He did right now. He doesn't have the right to do that. He doesn't have the right to speak for himself because um, I'm sure there's a great level of concern that this will keep the story going. And there's also the other part of it where um, the fear of him saying something else that might lead to, uh, this conflict uh, lasting even longer. So there's very practical reasons why um, he's not talking right now. The The unfortunate and unfair part of it is because he's not talking, it's very easy for this conversation to shift onto the players. And suddenly they become the ones responsible um, and answering for things that happened that they didn't do. And so that part, I think, is is unfair um, to them. And, uh, you know, it's it's tough because there's all these think pieces being being written about you when you're in that situation. And, uh, you know, which is, I guess, hypocritical for me to say because I just wrote one about it. But, <laughs> um, but, yeah, I mean, there's all these. It's like a conversation that's happening all around you in every corner and you're not a part of it. It's like when you are in a room and people in the room are talking about you like you're not there, but it's constant. And I remember when I was going through the thick of uh, the Donald Trump controversy, I walked into one of my favorite steakhouses and I was at, at the bar and um, the on the television screen, I was on three different networks at the same time. My picture, I was obviously not being interviewed but I was I was on three different networks at the same time and all these people talking about me as if I can't see them talking about me or you know I'm not around to know what's going on so that part can feel very very weird and probably pretty lonely too yeah I mean I guess I didn't um look at it as I I, f I didn't feel isolation as much as I felt as if um as much as I, as, as much as I felt that uh, I was kind of a little toxic, that would probably be the word I would use. Is that you start feeling? It made me a little self conscious in public spaces because when, yeah, you know, it was uh, it was in conjunction with the fact that I was on television every day. You know, I was still doing Sports Center at the time, and so I'm on TV every day. And so when you walk into a restaurant and people start looking at you and you see the whispers, I don't know if it's because. I, I said the Patriots going to win the Super Bowl again, or if it's because they are a Trump supporter. Like I don't know what I'm what I'm walking into, yeah. and so it made me a, for a little while a little self conscious about being in public. I wanted to try to blend in, but that kind of became a little impossible. And another interesting part of this whole sports and politics issue comes down to now the NCAA, right? Like now all of a sudden sports and politics are, are a championing point and even something that people are building platforms on for presidential debates, right? Um, you know, you again wrote something that NCAA will never fix itself. It'll, it has to like rely on an outside entity. Why do you think it got to this point where it's like, 
the government has to get involved with college sports to make a change. Greed is just that simple. Um, you know, human nature is to take as much of the of the pie as possible. And in this case, the NCAA is getting 100% of the pie and they don't want it to change. They don't want to share a slice. They don't even want to give a bite, right? And so uh, Cory Booker, who I recently had on my podcast, um, he's made this a huge part of his presidential platform and he has action points about things he plans to do if he's elected president. And, uh, but it's a personal issue for him because he was a college athlete, a high school All-American, he played at Stanford. And so he understands the inside of what this looks like. And I know there's there are people in this country who are very resistant when the government gets involved in anything. And um, they consider that to be a sign of weakness or just um, heavy handed involvement. But in this case, I think it's absolutely ne- uh, necessary because of, of what the headline said is like, if you leave the NCAA to its own advices, it's going to continue to exploit college athletes. It's there is no other. That's their default position. Period. And, you know, President Mark Emmert has said that repeatedly uh, ever since, um, you know, California Governor Gavin Newsom signed into um, law uh, the ability for college athletes to make money off their name and in, in, in likeness. So I think people are naively thinking there can be some middle ground. But for the NCAA, it's it's they want all of it, you know. And so I just think. The model that they have in mind that they're trying to continue to stick to, um, they don't seem to either care, realize, comprehend that model does not work when you have billions of dollars being being pumped into this organization. It doesn't work when you're signing ten billion dollar TV deals. It is not an amateur sport anymore. The moment you sign um, a contract that makes it so financially lucrative. Uh, for your two biggest sports. And, um, you know, I, I just think some of this is just them doubling down on on ignorance. And some of it is just not being motivated to completely change a system that needs to be changed because they could they could be the, the forefront of something really revolutionary. But I don't think they look at it that way. I think they look at it as um you know, serving their own self-interest and trying to take care of the things they need to take care of uh, as opposed to being fair and taking care of the athletes that got you to this point where you can say you're a billion dollar enterprise. And so my prediction, you know, much like the Roman Empire at one point or uh, the NCAA is going to be the band still playing when the Titanic goes down. And I think what they have signed themselves up for is extinction. Because sooner or later, and it's starting to happen in in small pockets, but there will be a complete revolution by these players because these, as with each generation that comes through college sports, they're more and more savvy and knowledgeable about what they're worth. And as soon as they start to understand that on a widespread widespread scale, the NCAA is in trouble. Somebody's going to come in with a pay-for-play model and wipe them out or Maybe if you're the SEC and you decide, wait a minute, we have college football. um, You know, we have the most popular, arguably the most popular college football conference in America. Why don't we just separate from the NCAA? You don't need them to do it. Right. I mean, the college football playoff is not actually run by the NCAA. Right. And so there's only a matter of time before um, people start uh, saying, forget, you know, sticking with the label. I'm going independent. And then they get no cut. So that's why it's in their best interest to put forth a plan that's fair before they get totally wiped out. If you were in the NCAA, what would it look like? So for me, I mean, I think a great start is this Olympic model, which is like you make as much money as you want off your name and likeness and all of that. Because, um, you know, it's also it's so funny to me that the people who are constantly preaching capitalism and free market won't let them actually operate within a free market and suddenly the conversation shifts about free market to to fairness it's like okay look I got a nice place that I live but it's gonna always be a dude with a 25 million dollar house and I can't do anything about that but as long as I have an opportunity to maybe one day get the 25 million dollar house I'm good with that I may never reach it but at least I have an opportunity and I actually think it will work way better than they think because there are plenty of campuses like you take Stan- uh, Stanford, uh, for example, they had the Olympic swimmer, um, uh, Simone uh, Manuel. Right. What if she is able to do a bunch of camps? 
You know, she is going to be able to make money because of the name she's been able to to make for herself or autograph signings or be let her be in a Bob's vacuum commercial. Who cares? <laughs> right. And so they they are start they're confusing the argument by saying, oh, no, everybody's got to make the same. Why? Everybody is not on an equal playing system now. You know, everybody knows that the football team gets more resources than the water polo team. Everybody knows that the athletic budget at Alabama doesn't look the same at Ball State. We know that now. So I don't really see any um, uh, any issue with how this is going to work when it comes to like Title IX and other things. I think the free market will essentially take care of itself. So let that happen. And I would say in that there are some cases, depending on who the athlete is, that you need to, especially with, you know, a, a Zion Williamson, where, you're, where guys that are hugely popular at a different level than than everybody else. Um, that they might need to develop separate contracts and partnerships with people like them uh, so um, that everybody's protected, mostly that athlete themselves. There's nothing wrong with making a lot of money in college. There's nothing wrong with that. And I think in some cases, maybe you might see some of these guys stay longer if they didn't feel like they needed to go to the pros right away to make a bunch of money. Um, but it's always been little things that they could do in turn paying for players, uh, their parents travel. I know there are certain stipulations where they can send them home X amount of times a year. Why are we putting a cap on it? Like send them home, you know, and, uh, considering these scholarships are not four year scholarships, they're one year renewables. Um, why not have it so that the athlete at any time, and this is something that Cory Booker, uh, discusses as well. Anytime they can go back to college for free. Give them a lifetime education. So what? You know what I'm saying? Um, you know, that might also not just improve their quality of life, but I think in many respects, it would uh, promote taking education a little more seriously. So there's a ton of things that they can do. And I just think it's really lazy whenever they say or whenever people who are trying to defend them in CAA say, well, how would they do it? And, you know, it's so complicated. They make it sound they honestly make it sound like time travel. It's not that complicated. Yeah. You guys certainly figured out a way to keep all the money. I'm sure you can figure out a way to actually share some of it. And do you think at least at the collegiate level, it could succeed as like a professional model attached to a college, right? I think that's something people don't even think about. Like what if, for example, I will just say Stanford's athletic department went and ran itself and licensed Stanford's logo from Stanford and just was like, okay, we're going to run ourselves as a separate entity and we're going to be the Stanford athletic department, but we're going to be... A, a business. A business, yeah. I mean, I, I think that's more realistic for sure. And it, it honestly probably cuts a lot of the red tape because they're trying to they're trying to have it both ways and, um, you know, have all the benefits of being a business. But yet, um, you know, sort of cling to this ideal, this utopian ideal of being, you know, amateurism and it's not. And so. You know, it, it, I don't think it's as hard to figure out as as we make it seem in. You know, there are a lot of people who are acting as if they somehow will not be able to carry on with their lives if they know that college athletes are getting paid. Like that's taking away some enjoyment from them from the game because they like to fool themselves into emotionally thinking that, you know, that they're just there for the love of the game and the love of the school. And while some of that might actually um, be true. There's so many of them that want to go to the next level anyway. And I think you can still find little ways to make that distinction between pro and college. But, uh, you know, at the end of the day, it's like you if compensation isn't on the table, the NCAA is going to be doomed at some point. What do you think dooms it at the end of the day? Uh, I, I think uh, athletes are just going to get tired of it. Um, tired of having to follow the rules, tired of being cut out of the pie and um, especially you're looking at college football and what some of these coaches contracts look like. And you see somebody like, you know, Dabo Sweeney guaranteed $91 million, like a college coach. He's damn near making what John Gruden makes. Right. And so if you're a kid that's watching that and say he is 91 million and I get nothing. No, that's not going to sit right. Um, look, maybe Maurice Claret didn't have the wasn't the right person to do it. But I feel like at some point, a college athlete is going to try the the NFL about this. You know, you got to wait till three years um, from your high school graduating class to be eligible, because, I mean, in truth, uh, you're you're limiting somebody's ability to make money. And I get the NFL is a private enterprise, but nobody, no other business is really allowed to do that. Uh, and. 
everybody knows that it's only a matter of time sooner rather than later the NBA is going to get rid of this one and done rule because it was pointless and so uh, as that happens um, as players explore going out of high school and going to the G League or going overseas I think they're going to become much uh, sharper and smarter about avoiding the NCAA altogether Uh, or I mean even in little ways like in college football Um, The players are using the system to their benefit. That's why suddenly you see so many graduate transfers. Um, They're leaving high school earlier to get the clock ticking, you know, and um, and they can graduate earlier and then they can transfer without having to sit out and just go like if their situation isn't working out, they'll just go somewhere else. And, you know, they what you wind up doing the NCAA by by kind of ignoring reality is that you create quite an underground economy. And so unless they want to spend you know, a bunch of so many legal fees dealing with the FBI, dealing with um, some of these uh, situations with boosters. It's like it just makes so much more sense to operate from uh, like a business from the from the top to the bottom. Do you think the NCAA can save itself? Nope. I I think they're going to they unless there is not just new leadership, but a new mentality. They as I said, they will be playing on the Titanic as it goes down. Speakers will be exploding and they're going to still be playing. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> and part of this, the college conversation, and, and even personally what you've talked about before is is the distinction between an HBCU and these historically white colleges as well and the difference in the power broking there. And I, I know you had a, a story on you know, a basketball player, power, you know, power basketball player, five-star recruit, taking a visit to Howard and the impact that that could have. Do you see that if something happens with the NCAA, these – HBCUs now have a, a much larger role in the conversation. Uh, I, I hate that I forget um, the organization's name, but there's already an organization who's um, trying to drum up support for that, to, for, for the HBCUs to to adopt a pay for play model and leave the NCAA. And that's why I said it's, it's really just a matter of time before somebody does that. And considering that um, the conversation about whether or not college athletes should be paid is not the same conversation at HBCUs that it is at predominantly white colleges. Uh, they also have an opportunity to shake up the marketplace by separating from the NCAA and creating a real pay for play model that will theoretically, that should attract more, um, you know, top tier players to them. Um, they can kind of, they, they couldn't completely cut out the, cut the NCAA out the picture, but they can certainly disrupt what the system is if they decided to do that. And, they would have the extra appeal of, you know, having um, black athletes know that by going to HBCU that uh, they're contributing to what was once for this, you know, country and for, you know, black America in particular, that was its core base. Um, even now, even with obviously the ability for anybody to go anywhere, I mean, HBCUs uh, produce 40 percent. Of black professionals in the workplace. That's a high number. And so from an empowerment standpoint, a community empowerment standpoint, it could be really, really powerful. And I could definitely see that being a worthwhile, attractive message uh, to a lot of, of top tier um, players. And how does that change, change the landscape then? Well, um, it kind of shifts it back a little bit toward what it used to be. I mean, for people who don't know this, but um The reason that, I mean, part of the reason integration happened at the college football level is because uh, HBCUs had all the best athletes, all of them. And, um, you know, it it was coming to a point where uh, the in terms of the type of of football that was being played at at, uh, predominantly white institutions, it was falling behind um, from a style standpoint from a, a competitive uh, competitiveness standpoint. And I mean, in the, the piece I did for the Atlantic about uh, what would happen if HBCUs, uh, if black athletes went to HBCUs instead of PWIs, which was what is called uh, predominantly white institutions. Um, you know, one of the seminal moments was when Alabama played USC and USC had a black quarterback and uh, Alabama got ran. And um, even my own alma mater, Michigan State, uh, Duffy Doherty, uh, back in the mid 60s, he started recruiting black players such as Bubba Smith um, and Michigan State won, wound up winning uh, about 10 national championships because of that. So they totally changed the game. 
at that level. And so if you begin to take away some of that talent and redirect it back into HBCUs and in present day, uh, you're looking at a weakened product. And so that's a significant way it changes the landscape and just financially. I mean, you know, Texas has an athletic budget that's almost $200 million. The biggest budget at for HBCUs, I think, is Prairie View, which is $20 million. So imagine that number looking a little bit more like Texas as opposed to what it looks like now. And now you're talking about, um, you know, uh, historically black institutions being able to compete in a much different way than they are um, currently. So, I mean, I think it would just it would have a dramatic impact on on what the landscape looked like. And earlier you said sports have an opportunity to unify us, but also like a lot of this stuff nowadays is, is built and chartered around sports. How is it that all of a sudden sports that was what's supposed to unify us and still does has become, I wouldn't say a political weapon, but has become like the center point for a lot of this conversation and leading back to what's going on. Uh, you know, some of that as I think, I guess, as having now lived through a few presidents, <laughs> some of that is just the fact that uh, the tone of government has a lot to do with, um, you know, how sports is viewed. And if you re if you go back to when George W. Bush was president and everybody remembers, um, you know, of course, as a as a nation, we were mourning because of 9-11. Yeah. But post 9-11, when sports became a huge centerpiece in the healing of this country, um, you know, that that is people, you know, felt, um, you know, that sports was very healing, um, that it was bringing people together and that it was giving a little bit of a band-aid over what was a wound that, you know, will never close, honestly, given the, the level uh, of the attack that, you know, this country suffered. It works the opposite way as well. Um, you know, currently have a president who has inserted himself in sports many, many times and not in a way that's unifying, but in a way that's divisive. And so it has put... Um, sports in a very awkward place that it's not used to being. And that's not to say that every president that, that was in office, people all agreed with. That was not the case. It's the reason why those approval rate, uh, ratings tend to be in the 60s. It yeah. <laughs> means that like, there's a lot of people. It's half who, on one side, half yeah, on the other it's side. Yeah, like, it's about half and half a lot of times. And so, um, but when you put a president in, in office that has uh, been able to, uh, been able to been able to like uh, just emit this kind of divisiveness. It was going to bleed down, especially as he talks about sports. And I mean, a president with a vendetta against the NFL, which is the most popular sport in the country, was going to put, um, you know, things in an awkward place. And so um, I think that's part of the reason why sports feels a little bit differently. And when you have uh, the players, the majority of players and in, in the two most popular sports in America or two of the most popular in the NBA and NFL. And the majority of them are both um, are dominated by black players who feel marginalized at this time in the country. It's going to add a pretty volatile mix to the conversation of sports. It's going to feel a lot differently. So um, I do think that tone has a lot to do with it. And, uh, you know, I, I think with a, a less divisive tone, you may see, um, kind of a different reaction in the sports world than what we're currently seeing now. And overall for the sports world, like the biggest knock, just especially on, not on the playing field, but on the side of which, you know, the executive said is that for a long time, it's been not very diverse. It's been an old boys club. Do you think a lot of what has happened there and not being forward thinking or potentially inclusive at the, at the top has contributed to potentially why things are now as, as such as, as they are? I mean, I think the NFL is a pretty good example of that. You have a lot of old money in the NFL, a lot of teams and ownership that has just been passed down from generation to generation. So they haven't they haven't even um, um, provided for the opportunity for there to be more inclusiveness. NFL teams don't come up for sale that often. And so that's, you know, kind of also a logistical part of it. But I do think um, that some of it is just frankly intentional and that there has just been uh, a reluctance um, and avoidance of trying to make the NFL look more representative of the product that it puts out, you know, on the field. And so I think that's why when these issues pop up, you know, like the player protests, police brutality, 
you know, racism, some of these issues that have been discussed in the open in the NFL in the last couple of years, when those when those crop up, that I think the default position for the NFL is to make it go away, in particular by throwing money at it. And that's not really going to solve anything. Its core problem is not that. Its core problem is that um, they just do not have enough of a diverse and inclusive leadership to have an honest conversation about what's happening in the NFL and influencing the NFL to make some of the decisions that they make. What's the sports industry look like Sorry, five, 10, 20 years from now? Just a heads up your next guest is here. Cool. What do you, I said, what do you think the sports industry looks like for the next five, 10, 20 years? Yeah, it's, it's funny because I know people have been predicting now for a little while that there's going to be a sports bubble, yeah. right? That it's going to break. And I mean, LA has what? 11 teams now? Yeah, I know, right? Yeah. Might be a sports bubble just here. <laughs> That's true. Um, and kind of their fault is like, you take it away, you let people get used to not having it. How do you think they're going to react? <laughs> you know? The, so, um, but yet, I don't, I don't really think that'll be the case. I think what you'll see is, like the NFL is, I don't see, at least in my lifetime, the NFL just completely self-destructing and falling down, even though people have been like, oh, people are going to get tired of the concussions and the other stuff and, you know, whatever. It will be death by a thousand paper cuts. Um, and so by that, I mean that people just will start to have more options. I mean, you already see it now. They already see it now, right? Is that I'm really curious because the way that millennials watch sports and what sports they like versus, say, my generation or, um, you know, or even older is markedly different. And while I don't think the NFL is going away or is going to go extinct, one one uh, statistic with them really jumps out at me is when you look at their the age of their average fan and it keeps getting older. That's not a good sign. And. I'm not surprised that, you know, today with um, cell phones and technology, so many more options for um, younger people, they're not exactly content on sitting down and watching a football game for three and a half, four hours. It is not. Hey, when I was growing up, my favorite sport was baseball, right? And people complain routinely about how long baseball games are in present day. But when I was a kid, it didn't seem like, uh, it didn't seem like much of a, um, much a, of an inconvenience at all. Why? Because I didn't have any other options. You didn't, <laughs> so have, a, you didn't have a cell phone. I didn't have a cell time. phone. I didn't have Netflix. I didn't have Hulu. I didn't have all these other things that could easily take away my attention. So that's the thing that the sports leagues have to compete against is that there's a fight for everybody's attention. And I think for a long time, sports took that for granted, that they could always get it no matter how long it was, no matter um, how good teams were or coaches were or what the game looked like. They counted on you being there. And I don't think they could count on that anymore. So I just see much more competition uh, for the major sports leagues than before. But I also feel like there's certain sports who are in the perfect position to handle the millennial viewer. I think the NBA is perfectly poised. I don't know if it will ever get as popular as the NFL, but they certainly have a lot going for it that leads me to believe that they're in a great place. I mean, individual players that are able to achieve global startup, the marketing how they allow their players to freely use social media to, to not just market themselves, but to show their authenticity. Um, the fact that it's a fast game, that always helps. And then you look at soccer, same thing. It's just like, you know, you have a game that globally is the most popular game um, in the world. And while I know there's been a lot of stop starts with that popularity in America, I think they're on the upward trend like crazy. And with, you know, FIFA being such a popular video game, that sport is trending high. And so, yeah, I mean, I think um, these these other leagues that the NFL is used to not considering competition suddenly will become major competition. And now we talked about the future of sports. What about the future of Jamel? Right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm day to day. <laughs> okay. I am day to day. You know, I was younger. Um, the five year plan was everything, right? Yeah. Ten year plan. You know, you had to figure out where you're going to be in the next minute. I look. I'm just happy if I make my next appointment on time. And um. <laughs> Which is not a bad feeling to have yeah. because I think one thing I've been able to do is I've been able to really adapt over the last five to seven years of my career. When I got to ESPN in 2006, I came in as a dot-com columnist. Television was not in the front 
view, the rear view, the side view, my peripheral, none of that. Zero. <laughs> Zero. I didn't want to be on TV. Yeah. And fast forward five, six years later, it was 50% of my job. Another two years, I was on TV every day. So uh, to me, it was a great example of how you, it's not that you have to have, and I tell this to young people all the time because I, I get it. When, you, when you're when you younger, you have anxiety a lot about where you're supposed to be. Are you making the right decision? What your life looks like five years from now? And um, there's a there's beauty in not knowing and in uncertainty. Um, and there is also a lot that can be learned by being able to be adaptable. Um, understandably, in our business and journalism, huge concern about the future of journalism. It's been that way in my career for the last 20 years since I stepped foot in this. They were people very concerned about what the future was as less and less people were reading the paper. Got concerned, um, not got concerned, but there was so much uh, concentration and focus, overly focus on the method and not the information. Information is still just as powerful as it was um, when I got in the business. And long before I did, it was just as powerful then. Focus less on method, focus on the fact that people will always want to be told something they didn't know. And they will always want someone else who presumably is smarter than them to put these things into context. Journalists are here to chronicle history and to not, and to hold governments, powerful entities and people accountable. That never goes away. That never gets old. Uh, despite how many people claim they hate journalists. All right. And so um, I say all that to say is that I think as long as that's the, okay, that's the case and I'm focused on those things I'll be able to adapt whether uh, the method in which I'm reaching people is on a stone tablet, on Instagram, or something else in the future. I can't even contemplate. There'll be a hologram in the room. Exactly. Yeah. You know, uh, so whether I'm virtual, uh, virtual uh, reality, Jamel, in 10 years or not. <laughs> so I, that's why I don't I don't really um, trip about uh, the, the waves of technology. I mean, you, of course, number one is that you have to be interested in learning those things. But. Uh, you know, I have a, a couple decent gifts. One of them is journalism, the ability to tell a story. And I just, I just think those are, those are gifts that always serve you well, no matter what. And so as long as I'm focused on that part of it, I'm not really concerned about where I'll be in, in five years, because I know as I have been for the last 22 years, I'll be doing that, telling, telling a story, um, or telling people something that they didn't know they needed to know.